playoff basketball in the NBA, when you walk in a building, it's so tense that you could reach out and touch the the electricity. It was just a dog fight. It, it was a battle. It was a low scoring battle. I didn't really um, get caught up in the you know in the confetti part of it. Kind of is what it is. But you know, looking back on it, it I think it's pretty funny. Nico, Sean Grandy here for yet another episode of View from the Rafters behind the scenes with the Boston Celtics. We're in the Paul Pierce room here at 100 Causeway Street, the Celtics' new front office. Uh, what do you think of these digs, Sean? Is this where he does all his videos? It, it is. See? It it's, is. Uh, it's a good room. It is not. I don't think that would pass here. I don't think that would fly. Uh, hey, before we get into this, just want to remind you all to give us a rate, review, uh, and subscribe. We appreciate you for listening. Hopefully you guys tune in every week and you get those uh, notifications every Tuesday and Wednesday. There's a bell, right? There is a notification is, bell or something yes, like that? Yes, yeah. there is. It's like a text. Y- yes. I-, I actually get it on my own phone. Every We're all Pavl- so. Pavlovian now. <laughs> Ding, something's happening. Run to your phone. Uh, but yeah, so Sean, today we're diving into Celtics Sixers history and one game in particular. We're not going to go go there yet. But Celtics and, and Sixers has quite a background. I just want to go through this list of names that we've got mm. uh, in the history of this rivalry. So they've met 14 times in the playoffs eight times in the Eastern Conference Finals. And here we go, decade by decade. By decade. Russell and Wilt in the 60s. Havlicek and Dr. J in the 70s. Bird and Dr. J in the 80s. Iverson and Pierce in the 2000s. KG and Evan Turner in the 2010s. <laughs> Shout out to Evan Turner, the GOAT. And then now we've got Tatum and Embiid going back and forth. This has to be the best conference rivalry in the NBA Am I wrong there? No, it still exists. You know, among the fans, there's still a thing. Generationally, it's sort of been passed on. Obviously, I'm, I've been with Cedric Maxwell for 22 years, and it runs deep. The Laker thing is significant with him, but I think the Sixer thing really runs the strongest in a lot of ways. And it goes back to, in 2009, the Celtics and Bulls has that epic first round playoff series in which we were all discussing, uh, including you know with uh, you know with Doris, who's going to join us later, mm-hmm. that. Is this the greatest playoff series ever? And man, I fall back. And Max thought it was as it was going on. That's the best which, series I've ever. Which watched. to me was amazing, considering he played in the one I consider to be the best series mm-hmm. ever, which is the '81 Eastern Conference Finals, which not only has the three-one comeback, but every single game went down to the wire. And that, as we move into this 2018 series, this is a, a theme you're going to hear a lot. This was a Seven game series disguised as a five game series because the games were so close. And this easily, a couple of balls bounce a different way. The Sixers win this series. No, no question about that. And Brad Stevens, as you'll hear later in this episode, he talks about that. Uh, and you teased it there. We've got some real star studded guests that are coming on this show today. We've got you, obviously. We've got me. Uh, that's not quite on the level of Al Horford. Brad Stevens and Doris Burke, who actually called the game that we're talking about today. And I, mean, I, I called the game, too. You, you did know. call the game. We're talking about hey, the radio on. broadcast. Okay, Sean called the wow. game as well. Maybe we'll get so a couple of— you know, That just sums up the last 22 <laughs> maybe, years. Maybe we'll get— I was in my car. I had to listen. I couldn't get to a TV. <laughs> well, maybe we'll get a couple of your calls worked into this. Um, but with that being said, just to let everyone know what game we're talking about here, I've got a little surprise for you. So I want you to flip this envelope over, tell me what it says, and then take a look inside says the Academy Award goes to Chris Rock. Oh, no, this is for, uh, oh, from the confetti game, which is May 5th in 2018. And let me guess, what's inside? Is this That's actual? confetti. Real that is live, actual confetti. Real from, live confetti. From that game. I'm not, I'm not throwing this <laughs> in. Our producer's telling us to throw it in the air. We'll do that at the end. But Right, you don't do it. If if we listen, if we were to throw the confetti now, that would be throwing it prematurely before the game. Ooh. Oh, zing! And that's exactly why we're here. That's exactly why we're here. This is one of the most memorable games that I've ever covered, and I was there. I know you were there. Um, but to have an envelope filled with confetti from a specific game, you've got to know that it's a big deal. And this one certainly was. We're talking about 2018 Eastern Conference Semifinals: Celtics versus Sixers. Game three, it goes down to the wire, and it's one of the wildest endings that I've ever seen. With it, For a moment, it seemed like neither team wanted to take it. For a moment, it seemed like both teams wanted to give it away. What do you remember most about that game as you were calling it? I, I think the first thing you flash back to is the owl play, and you sort of replaying it over and over again, and then you get to 
the confetti and Bellinelli and was good and wasn't it good. But, uh, you know, to, to set the stage properly for Game 3, you have to remember these seasons that these two teams had because this is the first time, this is the, the process in Philadelphia finally coming to fruition. At They're least finally they thought. there. They thought, but, but remember, compared to what had been, the Sixers had been a terrible team. They've been winning 15, 18 games. Their fans have been going through it, waiting for this playoff run. And then the Sixers went crazy in the second half of the year. Remember, this is the year that begins on opening night with Gordon Hayward breaking his leg in five minutes. Celtic season is ruined. What got overlooked that night, which will forever be remembered for the Gordon Hayward injury, is that that was Jason Tatum's debut. His rookie game in the NBA, in the starting lineup. It's a really then, good point. And that everyone always forgets that yeah. part. He's got the hair and the whole thing. It's like, oh my gosh, then when he really was... 19 years old, and the Celtics lost the next night to Milwaukee in the home opener and then put together one of the most absurd and improbable 16-game winning streaks in NBA history that came after that. And the Celtics had the lead in the East all year, the entire year culminating with the win over Philadelphia, a 20-point comeback win against the Sixers in London, and the Celtics were up by like five games. Mm -hmm. Well, flash forward to where we're going to be here in a few months. The Sixers had been significantly bad. They had been the, one of the best teams in the NBA the second half of that year, and they had almost caught the Celtics. Celtics had home court advantage, but they had been pushed to seven by Milwaukee in the first round, and many people thought, and logically so, that the Sixers were going to win the series because they had been playing significantly better in the month or two going into this series. Celtics win game one, and game two, the Sixers are up by 22 in the second quarter. Robert Covington's hitting threes. And the Celtics look like they're going to get run off the floor, and they come back and win that game. They get like you know Tatum went on a run, Baines hit a big three in that game. But already you're getting to Philadelphia, and the Sixers feel this is why I'm setting it up this way because the Sixers feel we're the better team going in, we're playing much better. This should be one one right now, and so they're thinking out oh, we're going to get these two games in Philadelphia, and we're going to have the momentum back. And you left something else out there. Kyrie Irving's not playing for the Celtics. Either. Kyrie Irving gets hurt late, late in the year, and he won't come back. And all of a sudden, this leads to the Milwaukee series before it, which was the, you know, the scary Terry coming out party. And late in this game, Marcus Smart fouls out. Yep. Jalen Brown is coming back from missing game with his hamstring injury, and so there's a minutes limit on him. So it just seemed like everything that could possibly be stacked up against mm-hmm. the Celtics going into this game, and then late in the game, was stacked up against them. Yet they still found a way. Uh, to take this game home. So um, let's dive in and just take a watch. Shall we do that? Or you know what? Let's talk about the confetti first. Let's talk about the confetti first. When that was happening in real time, I know what was going through my mind, and it's just I'm dying laughing because it's just – it was kind of a laughter moment at another organization. And and listen, that's not to say that the Sixers are a laughing stock or anything like that. I'm just saying in that moment it was – very entertaining for me to see that the game was not over and yet there's confetti and it's it's not just a little bit of confetti it's a ton of confetti falling down and that the game has to be stopped i think it was stopped for seven or eight minutes that's what i was thinking is just how funny the situation is well, well, here, well here's the translation to that and the confetti which is what everybody's going to remember is that here you have gino right the victory cigar the degree to which the gino thing is carefully guarded as if you were, I remember that even the first year I was running in the championship year of 08, we had an assistant coach named Armand Hill, and I remember running it up by 13, 14 points with two two minutes to go, and him freaking out on the bench that it was too soon, too early. Back and by the way, in 2008, you didn't come back from 14 yeah. down with two now, minutes to go. You now can do it's it different. In a minute. Of course you can. But then you know, playing that too early, that was a, as verboten as it gets. So to have that moment to be on the trigger, the irony for me when you're asking me what was going on in the moment. I think a lot of people know, because they've heard this over the years, and in this era, the last 15 years, radio in the NBA has been thrown, just the way you so dismissively spoke of it at the start (laughs) of the podcast, we've been thrown to different parts of different arenas, and you can't see the, I mean, obviously Boston's the all-time worst, you can't see the court from where you're sitting. In Philadelphia, of all the places in all the world to be, it was one of the first places where we had to go up in 2006. And it was not center court, as it's supposed to be. It was right near the baseline. But it's that baseline that we're going to be talking about or looking at if you're watching on YouTube. So of all the radio locations in all the world, I had a perfect view of the fact that Bellinelli's foot was on the line. And I called it like that in real time. I thought he was on the line. So you're waiting. You never know when you have a review. Mm -hmm. But it just felt to me in real time like, 
uh, premature celebration. Bellinelli, catch and shoot, and it's good! They rule it a two, and we're going to overtime. That's what you thought, and I think some other people thought that too. Let's listen here real quick to our guests with Doris, Al, and Brad about what they were thinking in that moment. You know, we feel pretty good about the game, that we have it wrapped up, and then um, uh, Bellinelli makes an unbelievable play, hits the shot from the corner, um, during real time, I actually saw, I remember seeing him stepping on the line. So, uh, the, you know, I knew that it was a two at that point. From the broadcast position, Dave Pash was on the call and Marco was in the far corner. And you know, for a play-by-play guy, can you see it? Are you calling it off the monitor? There was some question whether it was a two or three. It was called a two. The, 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 the official was in the, in the perfect spot. And Bellinelli, to his credit, hit the shot, but... I was standing on the sideline and I could see, I, I thought it was a two right away. Mm-hmm. And so um, obviously the game got stalled there for a minute after that when the confetti all rained down. But <laughs> And then the confetti started to come down. So that, that, that sequence is all I remember. Then the confetti coming down and a lot, a lot of their players like running all, off to the locker room thinking the game was over. And, um, and, and yeah, that, that was that, that confetti. That was, that was something. All right. So that's what they had to say. That's what they remembered, Sean, this game going down to the wire. I think there was 15 lead changes in the game, 12 ties, neither team led by more than 10 at any point. And here we go down to the final minute. So we're just going to dive in to the final two minutes of this game, watch it unfold, react and talk about what we were thinking in those moments. And then also hear from what our guests had to think in those moments. So here we go. Two minutes left in the game. Game tied up at 83-83. Shot clock at five. Redick with three on the timer. Drives, now puts it off. And hits! It's a two by Redick, but what a shot. I think we also have to remember, too, as the game is getting tight, now this becomes the absolute must win for the Sixers, and that sort of changes the way you play. And Maybe you force really tough shots like that. That shot by Redick in that moment, I remember sitting in my baseline seat, right? And I'm looking at that, and I'm like, okay, this this just isn't the Celtics' night. It, there's no way they're going to overcome a game when the guy's hitting a shot like that to take the lead during the final couple minutes yet. You know, nobody, JJ, I tell you, nobody hits tough shots like that in the old days. So. But, and, and again, watching a 19-year-old, this was a lot, a big element of this game. Again, we're going to remember the confetti, we'll remember the outplay, but... Jason Tatum. And the Jalen play. And the Jalen play. But Tatum, as we're watching now, it's less sort of jarring than it was in the moment where you realize, oh, my goodness, Mm -hmm. he is what we say he is, and it's happening now in real time. It's not. There are glimpses of it. What he's doing every night, or most nights, in MVP caliber seasons, it wasn't obviously as frequent in his rookie year, but all of a sudden he's doing it, and he's doing it on this stage. And Sean's talking about right now, uh, one minute, 34 seconds left in regulation. Jason Tatum pulls up, and and the Celtics had been running this action for him that Brad talks about called stack, that they had been running it over and over during this game because it was was his comfort zone. It was Brad's comfort zone. He knew that this rookie could make the right reads, make the right plays, and get them a good look anytime they wanted, and that's exactly what he did here with a pull-up jumper to tie the game at 85-85. Yeah, listen, there's a cliche we use it all the time about rookies that you're not a rookie anymore, right, at this point of the season. But this is what we're talking about, where, you know, watch Jason Tatum the first 15, 20 games of the year. Got the Red talked about that opening night game against Cleveland when LeBron just for Jackson's mm-hmm. dunk attempt and all these things that he's trying to figure it out. But one of the things about Tatum we've seen throughout his career is how quickly he adjusts to situations and not being affected like this on the big stage. And you just said the key word. Brad had the comfort with him as a 19-year-old rookie. To have Which is to, insane. To have a go-to for him in a second-round playoff game. Mm-hmm. So Bellinelli gets fouled at the other end. He puts home a couple free throws. Yeah, we're, looking at, the Celtics, man. we're looking at 41.2 seconds left here. Celtics down by two. And this is just chaos here. Jalen Brown's taking a baseline, and basically Brad Stevens comes in from the corner just in the nick of time. And he's like, okay, we need to call a timeout. We need to call a timeout. What do you remember about that unfolding? That those are always dangerous. And it's funny because we're talking about Jason Tatum getting a feel. And where are we with Brad here? This is year five Mm -hmm. for Brad Stevens by this point. These are the kind of things you can't possibly prepare for. Mm -hmm. When in an NBA situation, as a new NBA coach, when are you calling a timeout in the middle of a possession? And it's 
it's late it's right in the at possession. The, at the late in the possession, you know, there's a everything happens in real time. These are all real time, quick twitch decisions that you have to make. And this was one of them where, you know, when it gets 10, 9, you're the you know, the risk reward of calling a timeout grows with each second that comes off that clock. And this is the first moment during these final couple minutes of regulation and overtime where Brad does step in and, and yeah. calls it a, a timeout, and we're going to have an, an ATO coming out of this. But ATOs is something that he, and that's after timeouts for anyone who doesn't know what that term stands for. But this guy built such a reputation. We're talking about he's only been coaching for five years at this point. He built such a reputation for being able to get quality looks at the basket, and it blew my mind what he accomplished in this game. I could not believe the two looks the Celtics got out of timeouts in this game. Most things you see in an NBA game that look like they're improvisation are things that have been prepared for and practiced and thought about for years and years and years. Brad Stevens was preparing to be an NBA head coach many years before he became an NBA head coach. He was studying out of timeout plays, and I don't think he thought in 2010, well, in three years I'm going to be the coach of the Boston Celtics. Nobody thought that. But listen – Go back to Brad's conversations. This always struck me. When people say, oh, Brad's a college coach or he wants to go back to college, I would laugh, and here's why. Listen to Gordon Hayward. I've had conversations with Gordon Hayward about the conversations he would have with Brad Mm -hmm. when he first went in the NBA his first couple of years, and Brad would call him up. And, of course, it was, how are you doing? How's the family? How's everything going? And then, because it was Brad, it would be, hey, tell me about that play you ran. (laughs) You know, and that was because Brad was watching from afar. That is, that's the the mind at work. And by the way, we're in an era now where who did, you know, Joe Mazzulli get a lot of these mm-hmm. out of time, out yep. plays from. And as is, I've said many times, Brad didn't necessarily create these. He stole them like all great artists. This is, this is what we say, Mark, about anyone that uses words or writes. Good writers borrow occasionally from other writers. Great writers steal outright. <laughs> and that is what, you know, what great coaches do. It's a matter of, there isn't a lot new. There isn't a lot original. It's, I better call this timeout with eight on the shot clock and implement this particular play at this particular time. That's what separates the elite. And now it's time to hear Brad talk about that exact topic of the studying and all the time that goes into being able to prepare for a moment like this. And then Doris will come in right after him to talk a little bit about what she thought about his ATOs at that time. Well, you've got to be able to perform in those moments. Um, And, you know, coach's job is to call the right timeouts, advance the ball, and try to get a great look. The um, The way that I approached it, and Matt Reynolds, who is our, uh, at the time was our video coordinator, is now an assistant coach, always gave me the last um, two minutes of close games of our opponent and all of the need plays on, all, what we call need plays on offense and defense. So if a team was down two against Philly or down three against Philly, I had every time that happened throughout the whole year already watched and how they guarded it, right? So you you have to know, okay, is there a chance they go zone? Well, Philly wasn't a zone team. Is there a chance they stay attached to their man? Well, Philly would mix that up. Is there a chance they're a switch one through five team? Philly would do that a lot. I remember how uncomfortable he was um, in the course of our coverage of Brad um, with the notion that he was like the basketball genius. He was truly uncomfortable with it. But you could not help but notice um, the details of preparation. And in particular, we talked often about their ability to execute after timeout. So special, you know, situ- the special situation basketball um, where, you know, you're thinking in your head as a coach, okay, their closing lineup is these five guys. Which particular uh, person am I going to go to in a particular moment? The other factor against Philly, yeah, I coached against Brett forever, and Brett was a heck of a coach. Um, And one of the things that he made really difficult was the inbounder on the defender, or the defending, the defender on the inbounder, oftentimes it was Simmons, was a, he was a little, little bit of a riverboat gambler. Like he would go and break your play up. He would go and shoot a passing lane. He would go and take a cutter and they would do what coaches call exit. So you didn't have an exact of what they were going to do. Um, but sometimes that's why you watch throughout the course of the 
previous few weeks and the year and everything else. And if you think about it down the stretch, two times he gets two different guys isolated in individual situations. For layups. For layups, and both guys score. All right, so we're back out of the timeout here. Sean, 25.8 seconds left on the, the game clock. Celtics down to eight seconds left on the shot clock. I don't know what you were expecting, but I wasn't expecting a layup. And that's exactly what we get here with Tatum tossing it over the top to Jalen for the layup. Lob inside, Brown catches and puts it in to tie the game at 87. What a play out of the timeout. The Sixers have a timeout left. We'll see if they use it. The beauty of this, and obviously, you know, as the play unfolds, it's foreshadowing of the play that's going to decide the game later, (laughs) which most things that happen, key plays, there's always foreshadowing because there's always something that happened before it, whether it's two minutes before in a previous game in the series, something that happened in the regular season or something that happened six months ago or something that happened the previous year that this accumulation of information that's going through coaches' heads and players' heads is what always plays out in these situations. And this that couldn't have been a better foreshadow of what was about to happen. And we're not going to hear Brad talk about it right here, but he told us when we were having our conversation with him, he has never had more trust in an inbounder than Jason Tatum. And Jason Tatum is the man who was inbounding this ball. He was able to read it on the fly and toss it perfectly over the top. And, and listen, credit to Jalen, too, because he had to have the athleticism to – he bumped his defender back and was able to catch it over the top and finish. But Jason Tatum was the man that he wanted passing the ball in that moment, which, again, we're talking about this kind of being his coming out party. He may not have scored that basket, but he certainly created it with that – Incredible pass over the It's the subplot of this series, of this particular game, but Ben Simmons was a rookie too. And when you think of the IQ, and obviously their careers have gone the way they've gone. That's with quotes when you around think it, about right? the Yes, when you think about the IQ, and remember that was the big chant that you, he that's a rookie yeah. at Tatum in yeah. Boston because Ben Simmons had sat out the year and then won Rookie of the Year. Ben Simmons beat Jason Tatum out for Rookie of the Year this year. But two players that young to have that crazy basketball IQ, that's insane. All right, let's hear what our guests had to say about this play that tied the game up at 87 with 24 seconds left. So as you're looking at it from a coach's perspective, Number one is stop. Are they going to be tight or are they going to protect the rim? So right now you see because why is Embiid tight? Because Al's out there. Mm -hmm. Which is exactly what you were just referencing. So then it is are they going to stay home or are they going to switch? And so. And they were switching, right? And look who's on the ball. Yep. So if I run something to try to throw it in front of Simmons, he might screw up the play by himself. So the ball's got to go somewhere else, in my opinion. Otherwise, you better have a hell of an inbounder who abuses pass fakes mm-hmm. and can trick somebody. I think a couple things on that play. Number one, its execution requires timing. If you're going to isolate somebody on the post, it is you know four guys moving appropriately, screening at the appropriate time, vacating particular areas on the floor at a particular time. And sometimes trying to identify and hunt a matchup and setting your screens in such a way and then the delivery of the pass. Like, there's a lot of moving parts, Mark, that have to come together. All right, Sean. So next up, game's tied at 87. Sixers bring the ball up court, and then the absolute unthinkable happens. Yeah, remember now, there was uh, was it earlier this year. No timeout. Now, remember early in the year? Bogdanovich in Indiana had thrown away a inbound pass. So there have been crazy steals like this, but this was, a, as you said, this is a live ball turnover, and it's the very last thing you're expecting. So we are so accustomed to these playoff games happening with here's a possession, timeout, here's a possession, timeout, here's a possession, timeout. And in your head, you're on the bench, you're thinking if you're the Sixers, you're either tied or, you know, with, the, with getting the ball, you're ahead. You're, the last thing you're thinking here with a live ball is that you're going to be down by two. Brown calls out the play. Here's Reddick with eight seconds to go. And Reddick, a loose ball, picked up by Rozier. They got a breakaway. Rozier to Brown. He puts it in with 1.7 left. A tragic turnover by Philadelphia leads to a layup on the other end and perhaps a 3-0 series lead. Uh, yeah, this this play, I just remember thinking how, like, J.J. Redick is not the type of player who's going to turn the ball over in that moment. He's one of the most intelligent players that you and I have probably ever seen, that many people have ever seen play the game of basketball. This was just a complete 
miscommunication at the most important juncture of the game to that point. Big moments can subtract points from your basketball IQ. I've <laughs> seen it for years. What are you, what are you saying? I'm saying that's what happened. Had a couple subtracted. Sean, the disbelief on the Philly fans' faces in this moment after uh, Jalen Brown puts this bucket home. I mean, watching back on it, I kind of enjoy seeing it on screen. I know you do. It's a great – listen, by the way, it's it's a great telecast. Um, and I know we're talking to Doris here. I think we'd be remiss. I'd be remiss. It's not my – you know, I, I would be not comfortable if we didn't talk about a guy – there aren't a lot of underrated play-by-play guys. In my profession, Dave Pash is absolutely one of them. He is one of the best all-around dude. And he, you know, I think he rose to the moment of this game, too. And again, that's my particular slant. I'm always going to look at the telecast first before the yeah. – as Brad looks at ATOs, I'm watching the telecast to see how it's all produced and directed. And you had a great story to tell, and that helps. But I thought I thought everybody here at, at ESPN did a great – well, speaking to that, in a moment, he's going to have to fill eight minutes of air. Yeah, time. Well, I mean, well, well, nothing is yeah, worse. Scal and I this year had to do, what, 45? With <laughs> yeah, that, that's that's true. Different. That, that might have been a little bit worse. Um, all right, so here we go. Final possession of regulation. 1.7 left on the clock. Celtics up by two after Rozier picked it off and gave it to Jalen for the transition layup. And here comes chaos. Bellinelli, catch and shoot, and it's good! They rule it a two. Marco Bellinelli sends it to an extra session. They've mobbed the floor here. In that corner where the fans are, I'm on the side where the cameras are, and I'm right on the baseline. That's just where I happen to be of all the places in all the world. And to me, you just have naked eye reactions, and you have to have instant reactions, even if you're far away. And to me, it just it just looked like he was on the line. Mm-hmm. I'd surprise, the biggest surprise to me was how long it took. Oh, my gosh. I just That moment was my, one of my favorite moments ever, knowing that it was a two. The players knew that it was a two, at least the Celtics players. The coaches knew that it was a two. And yet here's this confetti just raining down for eight minutes, one piece at a time, ten pieces at a time, just delaying an NBA playoff game that is basically going to decide the series. going to take a while to get the confetti off the floor here in Philadelphia as we've got overtime coming after Marco Bellinelli hits a baseline jumper, ruled on the floor as a two, confirmed by replay as a two. The confetti is actually still coming down yeah. from the sh- and There's a ton of it. It's going to take a while. Yeah. So, Sean, absolute chaos unfolds. Finally, final. I think the confetti still might be falling down in Philadelphia, but somehow we got the game resumed. This is a borderline fetish for you. <laughs> your enjoyment of this moment. I mean, we've you, got did the you envelope. put that under your pillow this like is, a tooth fairy or something? I've got, to, I've got to come clean here. This is not my envelope. This is our producer's envelope. John Picard, this is his. In the moment, he was smart enough to gra- grab up a few pieces of that confetti and throw. I, I'll, in full full disclosure, I have some from the parade in 08. Okay, so not the same. No, but, but it's. Uh, I'm just saying it's we're getting there. not the only person who's kept confetti for. <laughs> All right, so we get into OT. The game continues to go back and forth, and now we're looking at a minute 34 left. Celtics are down by four at this point. Mm-hmm. If they don't score and Philly puts one home, that might be the game right there. But who do the Celtics go to? All reliable in this game. The 19-year-old rookie. And this was one of my favorite plays that I've seen from him in his career. Crosses up Joel Embiid, gets to the basket, and throws the pump fake. Has the patience to make the right play there. Played 40 minutes tonight. Shot clock at eight. Tatum against Embiid. Tatum. Got Embiid off his feet. Great finish at the rim. Two-point game again. How about that play from the rookie? This was the moment where my eyes bulged and I said, okay, all right. The Celtics don't just have a really good rookie. They have a player who could potentially be an all-time great. I just think the, uh, I don't know if it's ironic or whatever it is, because Joel Embiid wasn't a dominant player in 2018. He wasn't dominant yet. And when you talk about, when we talked at the start of the podcast about rivalries and what makes them great, it's something we don't get as much in professional sports, which is the same player staying with the same team for many years over and over again, and that adds to rivalries. And you're reading this list of Havlicek and Dr. J and Larry, because those guys stayed with the team for eight, turned. nine, ten years. And of course, but Evan didn't. This is my point. Which one of these doesn't belong here? For that reason, of course, Evan Turner should have been a twenty-year sixer. We all know that, but it didn't happen. So, point being, here it is. We're sitting here looking back with nostalgia to a game five years ago. 
And we can talk about a game a couple of weeks ago where Tatum and Embiid are now going head-to-head and the layups that Tatum has gotten against Embiid over the years with different moves and everything, you know, was sort of born, as you said, of this moment. And it's not just us who thought that. Everyone else did. So let's hear what they had to say about Jason Tatum and really what most people see as his coming out party. This is when he established himself as, I'm a player everyone needs to pay attention to. This action stabilized me in that game. It felt like, okay, we need a good shot. Tatum will figure it out with a simple step in this. And that's when I knew that it was he was at a different level than even a couple months before. Um, then the next game, he reads a cut, and he back cuts for the game winner, right? So, yeah, or, yeah. I forget if it was Smart that hit him or he hit Smart. Yep. I so, can't I can't so one of them read the cut and the other cut and it was just like a it was a it was a 27-year-old veteran read, not a 19-year-old read and but this action which there were several versions of this in this game and he read it several different ways was just designed to give him a step and a read and he just made the right play over and over. He given me chills because he could pull it off and Joel Embiid has been one of the elite defenders. Not only is he elite, he's got dancer's feet at seven foot, 250 plus pounds. He can turn left and right. He, he can navigate east and west. And I go back to what I, I said about the demeanor. So, so Jason hits him with a move. You've got to get by and not to be sped up, not to have your mind ahead of where you want. So to dead stop in the restricted area with that guy in front of you and to have the presence of mind to keep your pivot down and then send the up fake that gets that defender committed and then finish the play at that age. I mean, I couldn't believe he pulled it off. I was like the fearlessness to attack in the moment and then again to be able to execute the move. I mean, shoot, pretty incredible stuff. I was just impressed with this poise. Um, I remember just kind of looking over my shoulder and being like, like, okay, um, like, like we, we got something here because he, it, it was timely plays. It was, you know, reading the defense, making the simple play, making the right play, but also not afraid, um, not afraid at all of the moment. He, I feel like he almost like, you know, he wanted to be in those positions uh, to make, make those plays, make those decisions. And uh, and down the stretch, you know, he was huge for us. But, but yeah, I feel like that Philly series, uh, you know, was kind of a, in my eyes, it was kind of like a, like a coming out party for him. So greatness takes what? An insatiable appetite to attack your weaknesses. And we have seen that from the outset of Jalen, or Jason's career. Jason has, has identified, oh, I made that mistake once in a critical moment. I'm not going to repeat that mistake. Oh, I don't finish going left. I don't finish well enough in the restricted area. I'm going to fix that. It takes humility and it takes work habits. And he's got both. That's how you become great. So, Sean, we're now fast forwarding to the final seconds of overtime. The Celtics are down by one. We've got 9.4 seconds left on the clock. Yet again... Brad Stevens says, I don't like what I'm seeing. I got to draw something up. But the funniest part about this, Sean, is that he calls the timeout, the team gets side out, and he has to call another timeout because he didn't like what he saw again. That, to me, is speaking to me and saying, okay, Brad knows exactly what he wants to get here. He didn't see it the first time around. Now he's got to make another adjustment to get exactly what he wants with why, these matchups. Well, there was too many timeouts back then, too, <laughs> is, is the other thing it shows. You don't yeah, see I, consecutive timeouts very often. No, you don't. And, I, you know, again, I think the margin with this team, again, going back to the beginning, no Gordon and no Kyrie, it wrote a great story with this team doing it without the two guys you thought you were going to lean on throughout the course of the year. And it just underscored what an amazing Celtic Al Horford has been, that he's never kind of grabbed the headlines, that there are – I'm glad he got this signature moment because he deserved it for the year he had and just sort of dragging this team through the playoffs It and to run a play for him and something that, you know, again, Brad had seen this before. He, I'll let Brad talk about it because he's going to talk about it obviously in a lot more detail. But 
from a step back 30,000 foot view of the season, the fact that Al would have his moment here could not have been more appropriate because when you th- we're talking about Jason Tatum, this and that, coming out party, Terry Rozier and Scary Terry and all this stuff. But who was the glue in 2018? Yeah, yeah. Opening night with all the injuries and everything that happened. Because Al got here and his first year was ruined by the vertigo and he had the concussion. We didn't know what was going to happen. And he didn't have a great start here. But this was, I-, I think, this entire year, game one to game 82, was the beginning of his true love affair with the city. Mr. Consistent playoff out always shows up when you need him most. I mean, it's it's as sure as a thing can be. Uh, and here it is, 8.4 seconds left. It will be Morris to inbound it again with 8.4 seconds to go in regulation. Having trouble again inbounding, fires to Horford underneath. Horford gets it to go! One point lead for Boston. Timeout Philly with 5.5 remaining in overtime. Marcus Morris Sr. over the top. Al Horford seals his defender, gets the layup going away to his left. Let's hear from Brad about the drawing up the play and what he was thinking from Al about his execution of the play and then from Doris for, uh, about her reaction to seeing this unfold live in front of her. Well, they switched on the Jalen play and they switched on that play, so you, you're probably not going to be playing against traditional coverages. You know you're not going to be playing against a zone, so you and you know you you think you know again, where they're going to be matched up, although they flip it here, I believe. And um, and so, and you know they're going to be tight to their men. There's not going to be like a guy standing at the rim if you're cutting and moving. So, um, and then you try to draw up based on the hours and hours of film you watched, you know, either something that you've used in the past or something that you stole from somebody else as you're watching them play against them. This play, we I ran for Andrew Smith at Butler um, to tie a game against LaSalle in 2000. That is incredible. Um, and we ran it several times. We ran it for Jay Crowder against Washington, not in an out-of-bounds play, but on just a action to win a game in Washington one year. You know, it, it was a pretty pretty great play. Um, and, uh, you know, Jalen did it, you know, in regulation. And then when, when it was my turn to do it, uh, I remember that coach drew it up and I was just like, man, I don't know if this is going to work. Like, you know, they already, you know, uh, we already did it once. They kind of know, you know, that that's a possibility. And um, and it, it was a great pass. And at that point, I was like, man, you just have to, you know, I just have to finish it. <laughs> you know, you just have to finish it. My biggest concern was, and I think now that Al's 36, the book's probably out on him, was him catching it on the other side of the rim and finishing. Yeah. Because he's usually... He, at the time, now that he's gotten older and better, he's got a nice little game to his right shoulder. At that time, <laughs> he wasn't quite as good as he is now. He's exactly right. Going in the in the in the other way, you know, I've you can count probably in one hand the amount of times I shot a, a left hand, you know, hook or or little push shot, and uh, and then when he drew it up like that, you know, it was one of those things that it was like, hey. You know, we need you to, you know, to take us home type thing. And and my mindset quickly shift to, you know, I got to make a play. got to make it happen. But that pass, I can't credit it enough. It, it was literally, it was perfect. And, um, and the play worked out just like he envisioned it. Basketball in particular, in, in a playoff game, but in the final, the clutch time, final five, within five, all those things. It's about the minutia and the details and the angles of screens and all the things. You know, there's a reason you talk over the course of a season about building habits and getting comfortable. And um, I don't know, Al, I feel like, was the stabilizer on that basketball team. And uh, so I thought it was a pretty special moment. And that rolling around the rim, who cares, right? Like the margin of winning in the NBA is, is so small so many times. I almost find the way that ball went through the hoop appropriate so sean al scores the go-ahead basket and so what is he? he's going to make play what do we what do we say in baseball right when you make a great defensive play you lead off yep, the next yep. inning but it, the the ball you can hide from the ball when you want to in basketball and the the big players who make the big plays in the big games the ball finds them and it found him here again 5.5 seconds left the, the sixers are taking the ball side out they've got plenty of time to get a shot off here 
but they don't get a shot off. Al Horford jumps the passing lane. Ben Simmons just really an uncharacteristic pass on his part. Kind of seemed like he thought that there was no chance at a defender being there, but Al, Al Horford again jumps the passing lane, takes it the other way, almost ran the clock out. They follow him. He makes a couple free throws, and essentially the game's over at that point. Here's what Al Horford thought on that particular play, and you're going to be interested to hear uh, his mindset going into this play with uh, Ben Simmons trying to inbound the ball to Joel Embiid at the top of the arc. Going back on it, I'm usually like, uh, you know, more conservative when it comes on the defensive end, especially on the inbound plays. Um, during that game and, and throughout, I, I'm never really taking risks like that. Um, but this time, uh, I was like, man, I'm going to make an effort um, to just kind of jam and bead and, uh, and make it tough uh, for the inbound, and I'm just going to go and make a play for it. I don't think they're going to expect it. And, um, and, and, you know, I took the gamble, and, and, and when, I, when I was able to tip the ball, my whole thing was like, man, let me just run and just try to dribble the clock out like you're saying. And, you know, they fouled me, and, uh, and, um, but, it, but it was great. Um, you know, at that point, I think they were – you know, I think we shook them up pretty good because they, you know, they had chances before that to kind of put us away, and uh, we just kept finding ways. So Al Horford steals the game, makes the free throws, seals the game. Obviously, Bellinelli clinks one off the back of the rim at the buzzer, but the Celtics outlast. You can see how excited these gu these guys are on the court in that moment. This was a dogfight, Sean. This was a dogfight, and the Celtics knew at this very moment that the series was theirs. Well, it's 3-0 when it easily could have been, you easily could be down 2-1. Was this? Easily, right. And <laughs> easily, Morris. easily could be down 2-1 with having to play a game four in Philadelphia, which Celtics did not play well. So I think it's what we've learned over the years and why the Celtics have had success, and more success than we thought they would in the playoffs is the margins are so small. And it's all these little plays we're talking about that make the difference. And the Sixers weren't, you know, maybe you go back the previous year, remember the Celtics out of nowhere go to the conference finals, the Isaiah Thomas year. And that stuff, playoff experience matters. As 100%. the 22 Celtics in the finals against Golden State, playoff experience matters. Finals experience matters. And maybe as we look back five years later with the eyes we're looking at, yeah, Philadelphia was playing better. Yeah, they were on a roll. But maybe the Celtics having been there and played all those playoff games, this group, the year before, with the exception of Isaiah. But remember, without your, hey, you add Kyrie and you add Gordon Hayward, but they're not here in the playoffs. Maybe all those playoff games coming from 2-0 down against Chicago, the seven-game series against Washington, maybe some of that you know paid off in a little moments in this series a year later. I would also say kind of a little twist on what you're saying there is that these moments in this series and in the Milwaukee series before that, right. going with, forward. with Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum going through that, and Marcus Smart to an extent, like he was still the young player at that time, that might have – contributed in a significant way to who these guys have now become. And we're talking about Defensive Player of the Year for Marcus Smart. We've got two NBA All-Stars and probably all NBA players this year in Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum. I mean, these moments in being able to overcome, that is history that your body and your mind are never going to forget. And these are these are miles that you put on the car, but they are, man, they are all-terrain, uphill miles. And they do pay dividends. Look back at the history of this league. The teams that win, generally speaking, have gone through adversity. The OA Celtics are sort of an exception, but sort of not, because the individual players had gone through it and had runs that fell short. Mm -hmm. But as a team, they hadn't. But yet, the teams that win, historically, are teams that tried to climb the mountain and couldn't and learned the lessons and brought them back a year later. And as we know, the Celtics go on to the, the conference finals in this, this season. They almost got there to the NBA finals, didn't quite make it against LeBron. Uh, but but after this series concluded, I mean, what, what was your takeaway uh, and what do you remember kind of looking back on, on that moment when the Celtics did secure um, secure the series to move on to the next round? I, a couple of things that, uh, you know, in the, in the heat of the moment, and maybe you'll hear the call, maybe you won't, but I remember thinking that there was an irony. The previous year, my call of them beating Washington in Game 7, the Kelly Olenek game was, and, you know, the Celtics have done this in the Eastern Conference Finals. And go figure, Brad Stevens is back in the Final Four. And flash forward a year later, and there were two elements of storytelling I was trying to do at the end when the Celtics won Game 5, which is one, Brad Stevens at Butler had gone to the Final Four, then Gordon Hayward left, and he went back to the Final Four anyway the next year, and look at what had happened. He goes to the Final Four, 
it's Gordon Hayward, and he gets back to the Final Four the next year. And the element that at this time, the, there wasn't a Jason Tatum hype train. There was a Ben Simmons hype train back in 2018. 100%. And he was the next guy. He was going to be the next best player in the league. And that I think I said something along the lines that he was the prince of the league, and the Celtics had beaten the prince, and now they'll face the king, which was – you know, Cleveland, obviously, in Game 7, you really felt the Celtics were going to have home court, that they were going to have a shot, you know, in that series. But it, that it was another, you know, step forward. Here we are five years later when it's a championship robust mentality. Then it was, wow, do you think, you know, they can get back to the conference finals? None of this was supposed to happen that year. We weren't supposed to go 16-2 and two with Kyrie Irving carrying them after the Gordon Hayward injury, and you certainly weren't supposed to make this run without the two of them. And here you are back in the in the conference finals, and, it was uh, amazing how quickly it had all happened that three years earlier, Brad Stevens started, what, 40 and 81, something like some, you know, the first year and a half, and the Celtics had become a top five team again with some teams go through five-year rebuilds, eight-year rebuilds, whatever. Celtics rebuild was 18 months. The juxtaposition of those emotions that you kind of just spoke about, those first five minutes of the season, I mean, you saw it and I saw it live in person. I mean, I, I couldn't fathom what was going on in front of my eyes. And there was so much hype before that season with the Celtics kind of yep. new, new big three with you've got Horford and Gordon and Kyrie out there. You just think that the season is over. Yep. Then 16 and two, how, like, how does that even happen? And then you fast forward to this moment where you're thinking, my God, they don't have Gordon. They don't have Kyrie. Can this team legitimately get to the finals? Like, is this real life right and now? We, you know, we're looking at it, Mark. We're looking at it with the Kyrie eyes that we have now. Let history not forget that Kyrie was an MVP candidate mm-hmm. in 2018. He was phenomenal in his first year as a Celtic, and he carried as he often is in his first year of his career to that. I, I, I think. Oh, there's no question that it was. Yeah, in 17, 18, he was everything he wanted to be. You know, he was the guy. Uh, and then, you know, things happen and we look at it with the eyes we look at it now, we're like without Kyrie, they went farther and yeah, we know how everything played out, but yeah, I, I don't think that should be lost, um, you know, in all of this, but it was a, you know, a game we're going to remember for, for Al, Al keeping his feet on the floor and them unable to keep the confetti coming from the ceiling. And finishing it going away, Al Horford, he used every bit of the rim on that bucket, but we're glad that he did. He made the confetti game, the confetti game, because yeah. you, we're not looking back on this today if he didn't lead the Celtics to the win down there in the clutch. And so, because it was the confetti game, flash forward two years later, and this is my only story on it, because I don't get into social media stuff. I don't get into the the Sixers. Um, you know, let's, listen, I, you know I've got friends that run that organization or whatever, or the, the, the coach and the GM, but they get aggressive on social media. Some teams do and some teams don't, and they do. We don't. So flash forward two years later, and then we're going to talk about Eileen here, who runs our social media, because in this moment – I remember her face forever. Two years later, we go into Philadelphia. Celtics were not playing well that January. Had lost, I think, five of six. Had lost all three games to the Sixers, right? And so the Sixers won the season series. We're on the bus getting ready to go to the airport, and they're putting a tweet out as if they won the championship, <laughs> so, beat the Celtics in a season series. And my first thought is, are you going to put a banner up for that? Like, beat the Celtics in a season series in 20? But, okay, that's their... Whatever style works for you. I'm not sitting here like, get off my lawn. You shouldn't do that in social media. If that's your thing, do it. It's great. But they had a big tweet, you know, just flexing yep. on winning a season series. And remember just Eileen's face that night, like, what do you do? How do you counter it? How do you answer it? And, you know, we didn't, we don't do that. Again, seven months later, Celtics and the Sixers meet in the bubble, mm-hmm. in the playoffs, in the first round. And the Celtics, of course, sweep the series. And while I never do this, because I remember I wanted to do this for Alina. I remember seeing her <laughs> face Because she night, couldn't, right? Because she couldn't. And that night, Celtics win the fourth game and they sweep the season series. And I quote tweeted the tweet from January, which said, Celtics, you know, Sixers win the season series. And I quote tweeted it and said, drop the confetti a little early again. Didn't <laughs> and there it is. Mic oh, drop for Sean Grandy. Or would you call that tweet drop? I don't know. I, I don't know I, what you would call you, you guys, you guys deal with it. Leave it, leave it to us. Yeah. Um, no, but the, an unbelievable moment in not only this rivalry, but the development of some of these great young players, um, and and really watching these guys grow up right before our eyes to become what they have become today. And listen, it's on the other side too. Joel Embiid <laughs> has grown leaps and bounds since this time in his career five years ago. We're unbelievably lucky. I, when the Celtics and Lakers met in 08, that wasn't supposed to happen. And yet here we got to have the second generation, right? A new generation of Celtics-Lakers were unbelievably fortunate 
to have another generation of Celtics Sixers where these games really matter. And who knows, maybe a couple months exactly. as we we might be seeing these teams go at it again. Uh, but that that's it. Looking back on the confetti game, one of my favorite games that I've ever covered here with the Boston Celtics. Sean, I hope it's there for you. And wait, what is this? Do we have a little... I, there it is. That's the confetti dropping down. <laughs> the real live actual confetti? And that's it. And with that, that's a wrap, Sean. The confetti game is in the books. <laughs>